Okay. Number three. Okay, now we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty today. We've got to remember the danger of saying Christ is delaying his coming. It's a dangerous thing. One thing we have to remember is that the evil servant probably once was a faithful servant. But one day he said to himself, he isn't coming for a long time. That's a dangerous thing for a Christian. I remember a little conversation I had with a person who doesn't go to this church. A lady, in fact, and, and I had a conversation with her. And uh, for some reason, we had got on the coming of Christ, and she just kind of almost made fun of Jesus coming. You know, oh, I've heard that my whole life. Are you serious? The rapture, Jesus is coming, millions missing. She kind of just made fun of it and laughed at it. And uh, then as we furthered the conversation, what was interesting was she started telling about her life. And even though for many, many years she had professed to be a believer, she really hadn't lived her life like she was a believer, okay? Uh, you know, and, and I won't go into all the details of her life. I'll let you, your imagination fill in all the blanks. And, and as, as I left that conversation, I thought to myself, that's very interesting. I wonder how she would have lived had she believed that Jesus was coming at any moment. It's a dangerous thing to say that Jesus isn't coming because if you believe Christ's return is still many, many years away, there's a temptation to slack off in your Christian life, to coast for a while, to let a few things slip, to not clean up your act. How many of you are having company for Memorial Day? Raise your hand. Come on. Man, y'all need to get a little bit more. Y'all afraid I'm setting you up for something? That's what it is. I'm not setting you up. Who's having company for Memorial Day? Not a soul. Y'all need to get more involved with your families. Hello? All right. Well, when is the last time you had someone over for dinner? Now, let's say that you've invited someone to your house tomorrow. Tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Now, depending upon your cooking ability, right, about 4 or 4.30, you're going to start preparing the meal. And depending upon how you like to clean your house, if you're at all like my wife, the house is already clean because you know Monday's coming and it's got to be clean today, right? All right. And so as, 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 as 6 o'clock uh, comes near, you know, you're preparing for your guest and, and you start shifting into that mode to get everything done so that the moment they arrive, you open the door, dinner's on the table and you welcome them and it's a joyous occasion. But how many of you know that the picture would really change if that dinner date was about a month off? Right? You'd say to yourself, what am I going to eat today? I guess I'll just have some microwave popcorn and a Coke for supper tonight. That's good enough. I'm not going to do those dishes. I'm going to wear these sweatpants and my slippers tonight. And I'm not going to shave or shower. I'm going to let the sweeping and the dusting and all of that go because they're not coming for a whole month. I've got plenty of time. But what if you invited them to come to dinner and you just said, hey, look, just show up any, whenever you want to. I'll be ready. Huh? Huh? What would you do then? You'd have to be on the alert, right? You'd have to keep the house clean. You'd have to keep a meal ready. And I can see some of y'all thinking, that ain't going to happen. Some of you are saying, not me. If someone's going to show up at my house unannounced and expect me to have a clean house and a meal prepared, they can forget it. They'll be welcomed in, but the house is going to be a little dirty. I'll probably be in my PJs and my slippers, and I got a peanut butter sandwich they can have. Hello? That might be true if it were a family member or a neighbor. But what if it was President Trump? Some of y'all saying I wouldn't let him into my house. Okay, what if it was Obama coming for a visit? What if he called and he said, listen, sometimes this month, me and I, I'm going to be there, the president or some important person like that. And they said, I'm coming over for dinner and I'm sorry. I can't be specific about when I'm coming, but just have everything ready. I'm going to be there with all my photographers that's going to make frontline head page, head, uh, news all over the world. How many of you think your house would be clean? How many of you think there'd always be a meal cooking? You'd be ready at any time. Come on. Listen, if we'd be willing to do that for a celebrity down here, how much more should we be willing to do that for Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Amen. Jesus said we've got to be ready. 
read a story of a man who was pastoring a church out on the west coast and unfortunately he didn't walk close to the Lord. He had a great gift of teaching and but unfortunately he fell into an area of, of sin. He began to have an affair with someone in the church that came out and he had to resign his pastorate and and uh, someone asked the man, they said, they said to him, what can you pass on to other Christians as a result of this experience? And, and this man answered, he said, when you stop walking with God, you're walking on the edge of a precipice. And Jesus said something like that only uh, with one slight addition. Jesus said, when you stop walking in the belief of the imminent return of Jesus Christ, you're walking on the edge of a precipice. Listen, it's so easy to fall into a life of bitterness and resentment or jealousy or in envy or self-indulgence or worldliness. Listen, this man made a theologic change, a simple change in a theological belief. But let me tell it had a profound impact on the way he lived his life and his behavior. Even his eternal well-being was at stake. Matthew chapter 24, let's read it. It says this. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master's delaying his coming. You say, are you sure this refers to the return of Christ? Absolutely. This is at the end of Matthew chapter 24. Read it in context and you'll understand it. And says he began to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The first thing we see is that the relationship that he had with his master changed. No longer did he have respect for the privileges that his master had given him. No longer was he thankful that he had been put in a place of privilege and leadership and was a servant in his master's house. Come on, how many know that if you're a child of the king, you're in a place of privilege? Come on. And ultimately, he lost out with his master. The second thing that changed was his relationship with his fellow servants. It says he began to beat his fellow servants. He no longer saw them as brothers and sisters in Christ. They are no longer co-heirs with Jesus. He lost his love for them. I want to tell you uh, that, that I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. Come on. Is there anybody else around here that would say, Hey, listen, don't mess with anybody in my family. Right? I preached a sermon one time in Colombia. I'll never forget it. It was called No Te Metes Conmigo. That means don't mess with me. Don't put yourself in with me. It was a simple little sermon, really. And it basically said, if you mess with me, you mess with Jesus. If you mess with me, you mess with God the Father. If you mess with me, you mess with the Holy Spirit. If you mess with me, all of my friends and family are going to be praying. If you mess with me, you take on the whole church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. I'm proud to be a part of the kingdom of God. Somebody say, give, give the Lord a big praise today. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We serve together. We fight the devil together. <laughs> We stand with each other and for each other. But this evil servant began to abuse the people in his own household. And then finally it leads to an error in regard to himself. He lost his way. It says he began to eat and drink with drunkards. That, by the way, was not uh, a means of uh, evangelism, all right? He lost his closest with Jesus, his love for others. And I believe by that statement we could easily say he lost his self-control. He decides to spend the rest of his time there wasting himself in a continuous party mode, eating and getting plastered every day. I mean, why should he worry? He thinks I've got plenty of time to make it right. But guess what happens? The scripture is very, very plain. Matthew 24 and verse 50 says this, The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware of and will these are powerful words it says and he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth man that's some powerful imagery in that mess in that in that parable right what did Jesus say? Jesus is saying, don't be caught unaware. Listen, Christ could return any day. We don't know when that final hour is appointed for us. The scripture says it's appointed on the man to die, and after that, a second chance. No, that's not what it says. It is appointed on a man once to die, and after that, the judgment. My friend, we've got to make certain that we're right with the Lord. To be cut in half sounds like the master pulls out a sword and literally cuts him in half. Well, 
we do know one thing, that God's word's a powerful two-edged sword. Right? And as painful as it would be to be cut in half, it would be even more painful to be judged by the sword of the word of Almighty God. Man. You know, the word divides the thought and the intent of the heart. <laughs> the scripture goes on to say to be given a portion with the hypocrites. You know what a hypocrite is, right? A hypocrite is an actor, someone who pretends, someone who acts a certain way, but they're really not, right? And uh, wow, it says they're poor. How many know that the portion for the hypocrites cannot be the same portion as the wise and faithful servant? It cannot be that way. Here's a portion for the hypocrites over here, and there's a portion for the wise and faithful servant over here. They cannot be the same thing, am I right? I'm just trying to understand the word here today. And then it goes on to, to say there, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, now there, most of the times when that you hear the words weeping and gnashing of teeth, there's also some other words that go right along beside it. And one of those words is hellfire or outer darkness. I'm just here today to tell you that we've got to be prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ. We've got to be ready. We cannot pretend, oh, that his coming is going to be, you know, 40 years from now or 50 years from now. Listen he could come today. He could come today. And I'll tell you, I, as a pastor, I believe in preaching on occasion on the soon return of Jesus. Because nothing makes me want to be righter with the Lord than to, than, 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 than to be right. The scripture talks about being unashamed at his appearing. Mm. But I got good news today. None of this has to happen to any of us. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand of praise. Amen. It doesn't happen to happen to you and to me. You say, well, what do I got to do? Let me tell you what you've got to do. You've got to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, first of all. You've got to make certain that it's not just one among many. Amen. Don't come worshiping Buddha and worshiping Jesus. Either he's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Come on, somebody. Amen. We've got to be ask him to come into our life to forgive us of our sins. And then the scripture says that we turn and we go in the opposite direction. We repent. We start following after him. Amen. Amen. And then we live a life that is faithful to him. We're careful about what we do. We're watchful about our life. We are obedient to the Lord. We stay in the word. We listen to the sweet voice of the Holy Spirit. Does anybody else hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? Amen. You don't want to know what he sounds like? Hey, don't do that. <laughs> what are you doing? Sometimes he speaks in the voice of my father-in-law. God don't like moaners and groaners, Bob. <laughs> Never get a moan and groan, ever. The Holy Spirit says that. But let me tell you, when you live your life that way, here's the end result. Matthew 24, 47. Come on, get ready to stand tall today. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all of his goods. I don't know about you. But let me tell you, that sounds pretty good. When Christ comes and he finds those who are faithful, those who've served him, those who put God first, those who prayed, those who've served the Lord, those who've been faithful in ministry, those who have, have helped their fellow man, those who've cared about others, let me tell you something. He says this, I've seen all that you've done. You've been faithful in a few things. Let me just make you a ruler over great things. Come on. Is there anybody that would say, I am ready. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. I don't know about you, but do you have a lifetime verse? We were in the car the other day, and my, we were talking about that, and I, I tell you what I believe my lifetime verse is. I don't know if I picked it or the Lord picked it for me, but here's my lifetime verse. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. That's my verse. Amen. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But let me tell you something. That's who I want to be, faithful and a wise servant. Amen. It'll pay in the end. It'll pay in the end. I've never heard anybody at the end of their life say this. Oh, I just wish I would have just spent more time at the office. I wish, bring me my 401k. I want to look and see how much I've amassed. Does anybody ever say that? 
Please, you know, let just take me back to my house.